Hello, it's Big Chats. We're doing My Battles with Cancer, a candid patient and caregiver's memoir. We're continuing on with the chapter, Going to the Hospital. I'm doing the entire book for free. I want it to be available to everyone and anybody um, who is either a patient or a caregiver or just knows someone who had cancer. I went through both. I was a patient and a caregiver. And um, I published the book back in 2020. I, I rewrote it. 2023 and um, republished that. And then I worked on the audiobook for about about a year and I just um, finished the audiobook. So it's available on Audible. My other books are also available in those formats. You can get Trading Wisdom um, and Trading Quotes. Those are also available um, on Amazon, Kindle, hardcover, audioback, audiobook, um, paperback as well. So I'm, um, let's continue on. Let's, and of course, I'm Big Cheds um, on Twitter and Cheds Trading on YouTube. I'm going to read through the book, and um, I may ad-lib a little bit. I may change the words around, um, but it's on the screen for you to read if you'd like. And if I make mistakes, I'm just going to keep going. Um, it's just one take, and uh, I'm just here we are. So going to the hospital, with a little bit of luck, I was able to arrive a few minute, with a few minutes to spare before my appointment. One of the first things I noticed were the windows. Stepping back and taking it all in, I saw a towering modern-style building with an almost stately feel to it. High above the entrance was a sign marking the name of the hospital, adorned with the brown and gold crest of the network to which it belonged. Just beside the building stood four massive streetlights, all angled to shine down towards the front door, perhaps as a symbol of the healing power a sick patient might hope to receive inside. Through those entryway doors I went, and I was immediately greeted by the sound of a guitar. That melody traveled magnificently as it bounced all around the room. First impressions are critical as they can have a great influence over how one perceives everything that comes to follow. My first impression was of a bright, vibrant, warm, considerate, and calming atmosphere. I immediately felt like I was in the right place and would be well taken care of, and that really helped to lower my stress level. After taking a deep breath and letting it all settle in, I looked around, and one thing I noticed was that there were a lot of people who were either bald or wearing bandanas on their heads. I looked at these folks who seemed sick to me, and I decided that I was never going to become like them, no matter what. It was important for me to have this attitude that I was going to be better off than the average person, even if that was unrealistic. Why was this important? Well, I had to think this way to push myself to stay positive and hopeful about my eventual outcome. I wanted to believe that I would be able to handle whatever came my way. When you're facing something like cancer that can potentially end your life, a normal emotional self-defense mechanism might be to tell yourself that you will be immune to the side effects of treatment, just as I did. Overconfident as always, I told myself I would never have to cut my hair or wear that silly bandana. I loved my hair. It was so long, in fact, that I could have a man bun or samurai look if I wanted to. It was the longest I had ever grown it in my life, and it was a source of pride for me, and I considered it to be my lion's mane. I also believed it showed others that I was confident and not afraid to go against the grain. So I was dead set on keeping my hair no matter what. After studying all these sick people, quote unquote sick people, I told myself I would never become like them. Another big reason for this confidence was that I planned on using CBD and THC if I did in fact have cancer as was suspected. I was fully convinced that with the help of this Eastern medicine, THC and CBD, I would be able to combat all the side effects of the Western medicine, chemotherapy and radiation. I had absolutely no doubt 
that I would end up being one of those lucky few to survive the treatment without suffering the worst of the side effects. After meeting up with my wife, I checked in at the front desk and confirmed with the staff that I didn't have any cold or cough symptoms that day, and they gave me a small white plastic bracelet with my name and other information on it, and suddenly I realized I was in fact a patient, and there would be no going back to the way things used to be. Being a patient was something I would have to get used to. Looking at that bracelet closely and then giving it some thought, I decided that going forward, I would wear my new accessory all the time to help guide me in the right direction. Wearing this bracelet would be a purposeful reminder to make the healthy lifestyle choices necessary to prepare my body to survive treatment and beat my illness. Next, I was directed to the imaging area to deliver the CD that had my MRI and CT scan results on it, and that way they could be entered into the system. Once my information had been uploaded, I was sent to another area of the hospital to have my blood drawn. Once I approached that waiting area, what jumped out to me was just how many people were there. As I looked around, I saw easily 50 or more people waiting some of whom were patients and others, presumably their caregivers, for support. It was really nice to see that many people offering comfort as their loved ones faced a difficult battle ahead. With my wife with me and my sister soon to join, I also had a strong support team, and that was something to be incredibly thankful for. After my name was called, I walked over to the nurse, a woman with golden brown hair, and I showed her my bracelet. She asked me to repeat my name and birthday again to make sure I was the right person. Along the way, we passed several smaller patient-sized rooms, and each of them were outfitted with an IV machine, computer terminal, and reclining hospital bed. We also passed a variety of staff members escorting patients around or transporting medical equipment as they performed various activities. It was a really busy place, and that really struck me. We eventually found our way to a large open area with nurses' stations in each corner and curtains that could be drawn to protect the privacy of the patient behind them. As I sat down, I looked around, and I saw other patients preparing to have their blood drawn, and both seemed comfortable while talking to their respective nurses. Once we arrived at our destination, again, I sat down, and in a chair that was designed so that whatever arm they were going to draw blood from, you could lay it down comfortably. The nurse then asked me which arm I wanted to have my blood drawn from, and I replied, whatever is easiest for you. Still fresh in my mind was that scan at the community hospital, the one that took the nurse five attempts to put in an IV line. This nurse also asked me if I had thought about getting a port, and I had no idea what that was. She then said the doctor would explain more about that later. And so I pressed her further, and she said that this is more or less a minor surgery to have this device installed beneath the skin, this port. Once it was in place, the port would would make it easier for the oncology staff to draw blood and administer medicine during treatment. According to Wikipedia, In medicine, a port is a small medical appliance installed beneath the skin. A catheter connects the port to a vein. Under the skin, the port has a septum through which drugs can be injected and blood samples can be drawn many times, usually with less discomfort for the patient than a more typical needle stick. Ports are usually... Ports are used mostly to treat hematology and oncology patients. After the nurse finished drawing my blood without incident, we set out for my appointment with the surgical oncologist. This next appointment was on one of the upper floors of the hospital, and I was determined to take the stairs. I told my wife, if I can't beat the stairs, then I won't be able to beat cancer. 
I knew I had to set the right attitude early on to stay positive and fight the good fight. Once my wife and I finally reached the upper floor of the hospital, I took a few moments to catch my breath, and then we made our way over to a new waiting area. This one was much smaller than the blood drawing area, but the chairs were a little nicer and appeared to be more comfortable to sit in. There were also a series of windows that lined the wall all the way down one side of the room, allowing sunlight to stream in and remind us of the world outside. From this new perch, I had a commanding view for miles away, and set before me was an interesting mix of older and newer buildings, the occasional tree or hint of nature, and the denizens of the city rushing around and dodging traffic. I was right in the heart of the city. In the corner of the waiting area was a large woven basket with a shiny green-leafed plant spurting out. And on on the side wall opposite the windows were framed photos of patients who had gone through treatment. And below those patients, words of encouragement were displayed, designed to remind us of just how powerful hope can be. As I continued to get the lay of the land, I glanced around the room, and I studied all the faces to figure out who else was a patient. I tried to imagine what type of cancer they had, and I wondered if they were as confident as I was about beating my illness. Taking a deep breath, I absorbed an impression of their body language, trying to learn how their cancer treatment had affected them, more or less I was reading the tea leaves, or in this case, the body language of the other patients, so I could prepare myself for whatever was to come next. At least that part I could control. As I sat there waiting, I saw a friendly old man with candid blue eyes pushing around a food cart. He was offering a wide array of sandwiches, snacks, and drinks to patients and caregivers. And I thought that was a very touching gesture. It struck me that most people are rushing through their daily lives and just trying to make their appointments on time. And there's, they don't always have time to eat before they come. Food can also be emotionally comforting. So a fresh beverage or a tasty snack can make a big difference during a potentially difficult visit to the hospital. This thoughtful gesture, along with the man playing the guitar in the lobby, were two clear examples to me of this hospital trying to make patients and caregivers feel more comfortable. After a little while, my name was called, and I was once again, I once again had to show my bracelet before reciting my name and birthday. This nurse led me into a small, sparsely adorned room where my vital signs were taken, and I was pleased to learn that they were normal. Vital signs are a basic series of tests that the medical professionals use to gauge a patient's health and to form a baseline to refer back to later. Normally, this consists of taking a patient's pulse rate, temperature, respiration rate, and blood pressure. The nurse then led me down a hallway and around a corner where my wife and I were told to take a seat in the examination room. And sitting there, I must admit, I was a bit nervous about meeting this surgical oncologist. Finding out what he had to say was a big deal. He was the real deal authority on these matters. The night before my appointment, I had reached this I had researched this doctor online and I learned that he was quite well respected in his field. Knowing that, knowing that I was seeing the right person made me feel pretty good. As we continued to wait, I tried to imagine what it must feel like to be on the other end of this arrangement. What it must feel like to have someone relying on you to have the power to save their life. Those are big shoes to fill. Also, part of me was Part of me was curious about how he would compare to the surgeon from the community hospital network. The old surgeon seemed just fine to me, despite all the concerns that my sister had so strongly registered. But what did I know? 
Shortly thereafter, the surgeon walked in the room wearing long black slacks and polished dress shoes. My impression of him was of a kind and gentle man. We started out by talking about my symptoms and his initial thoughts from the scans, and then he gave me a physical examination. With a stern look on his face, he poked and prodded at that strange growth on the left side of my body. This growth was so large and outwardly protruding that even a layman could see the seriousness of the matter. After completing his examination, the oncologist, the surgical oncologist, began to explain to my wife and I what the different biopsy options were. The first option was a core needle biopsy, where the surgeon would stick a three-inch needle into the center of the lymph node. This method would pull out enough tissue to make an accurate diagnosis. The second option was an excisional biopsy, where the surgeon would remove the entire lymph node. Given that I had other tumors in my body as well, the surgeon did not recommend that. We also discussed and seriously considered an incisional biopsy where they take out a cross-section of the lymph node rather than the entire thing. The surgical oncologist's recommendation was for a core needle biopsy. He explained that this technique was less invasive than the other two he had mentioned, but it still had excellent diagnostic accuracy. We thanked the doctor for his advice, and then we continued on to my next appointment with the medical oncologist. A medical oncologist is a doctor who treats cancer with chemotherapy. This particular doctor was the one who had been recommended by the head of my sister's department. The next appointment was two floors down, so we took the stairs again and checked in at another reception desk. After a little wait, my name was called and a friendly nurse led me into a new examination room. The medical oncologist walked in soon thereafter and he greeted us with a warm smile before settling down into his chair. Though he offered a disarming first impression, his serious eyes gave me the sense that this man was all about his business. This day he wore dark brown slacks, a sky blue polo shirt, and polished Oxford shoes. His apparent attention to detail while dressing gave me confidence that he approached his medical practice in a similar fashion. After completing the physical examination, the medical oncologist came to the same conclusion as the surgical oncologist in that we should get the core needle biopsy done. Though he was hesitant to come to a diagno diagnosis, he was upfront and honest about the fact that I probably had cancer. I listened closely as he explained that if it was cancer, I likely had something called lymphoma. Lymphoma is a blood cancer and would have to be treated with chemotherapy. Still absorbing the information, I stayed mostly quiet as my wife asked the doctor some questions. And eventually, we decided to press on and have that core needle biopsy done. The oncologist wanted it scheduled as soon as possible and set me up to return three days later. That night, when I got home, when I got home that night, I spent some time by myself trying to unwind and to process the day's events. And to be honest, I didn't even know where to start. It was an eerie feeling to hear this well-respected doctor say that I probably had cancer. That simple exchange made the crisis feel more real than ever. There was a weight to the moment that had not been there before. After the rest of my family went to bed, sound asleep, I spent hour after hour online trying to learn all about cancer. My imagination ran wild as I bounced around from page to page, following every little thread I could pull. Even after meeting with both doctors at the new hospital, I was still holding on to some hope that I didn't have cancer. This was a self-defense mechanism, a way to prevent having to deal with something as massive and paradigm-shifting as cancer. 
I, I convinced myself that it was logical enough to think this way, in part because I was not displaying many of the symptoms normally associated with lymphoma. One of the main symptoms of lymphoma is rapid weight loss. And though I did have quite a bit of recent weight loss that could easily be explained by my workout regimen. To prepare for a knee surgery earlier that year, I had lost almost 40 pounds. Excuse me. I had lost almost 40 pounds. My preparation routine was mostly taking long walks around town and spending time on the basketball, basketball court working on my jump shot. That's why I could easily explain away the weight loss. However, other common symptoms of lymphoma include night sweats, fatigue, and chest pain, and I didn't have any of those. So in my mind, it was still reasonable in some ways to believe that I did not have cancer. After a few more days of waiting, it was time for that core needle biopsy. Once I arrived at the hospital, I realized that I was nervous, but I told myself I was doing the right thing, and that helped to calm me down. I really wanted, rather I needed, to find out what was wrong. And so that way I could plan my counterattack against whatever had invaded my body. That survival instinct overrode any nervous feelings. Once I checked in at the front desk, I was given a new plastic ID bracelet and I was directed to a changing area to take off my street clothes. After putting on a hospital gown, I was led into the surgery prep area, and the nurse took my vital signs. She asked me about any medications I was taking and performed a standard pre-surgery screening process. Over the next 20 minutes, I must have had to repeat my name and birth date five times as the nurses came in over and over and over again. I found the redundancy interesting. But I decided that it was a good way to make sure that nothing slipped through the cracks. A few moments later, the surgeon walked into the prep area and introduced himself. Sporting light blue surgical scrubs and a hickory brown clipboard, he presented several forms that I needed to sign. Long in the tooth and with a wide face, he was an interesting looking man. Those eyes told me that I was just another patient he had to deal with before moving on to the next. And with that in mind, I listened intently as he explained the biopsy procedure. He told me that he would start out by applying lidocaine to the surface area around the lymph node and then would insert a needle to remove the tissue. After acknowledging that I understood what he had told me, I dutifully signed the consent forms. And a few minutes later a nurse brought me over to a hospital bed to lay down upon. As my torso was moved around into the correct position, I was instructed to raise my left hand and to rest it behind my head. And then finally, the lidocaine was applied to the armpit area where that really large lymph node was sticking out, really big lymph node. The surgeon insisted that I keep my arm above my head for the entire duration of the, of the procedure, and that was easily the hardest part, as I was now laying in an uncomfortable position. Once I was in place, the doctor applied the gel and then pressed that ultrasound sensor against the large protruding lymph node in my left armpit. As he began, up on that view screen, I could suddenly see what that tumor looked like beneath my skin. To a layman such as myself, it didn't seem like anything I could recognize other than maybe the inside of a cell membrane with squiggly lines everywhere. A little while later, I watched as he inserted that three-inch needle, and strangely, I didn't feel anything. It was almost as if I were watching the procedure happen to someone else, and I had a mild out-of-body experience. I watched as that needle went in and out of the lymph node three times to draw tissue. Once the incision site was patched up, I was finally allowed to rest my arm down by my side, and that was an amazing relief. Now that the procedure was complete, I felt a small sense of satisfaction, knowing that the medical professionals had the raw data they needed to make an actual diagnosis. 
the ball was rolling steadily towards a revelation. And with that revelation, I could form my plan of attack. It had been sheer agony not knowing exactly what I was dealing with. And once I was able to define my enemy, I could properly prepare myself to defeat it. The biopsy was performed on the Monday before Thanksgiving, and I was hoping, hoping against hope to get those results back before the holiday weekend. I really wanted some clarity for those conversations I thought I was going to have with friends and family over the holiday dinner table. Thanksgiving has always been my favorite holiday. Growing up, we would gather at my grandmother's house for a delicious feast. And those years of spending time with my cousins, uncles, and aunts are quite fondly remembered. Later in life, we carried that tradition forward, and Mom's house became the central meeting location. Mom always took so much pride in hosting those events. Every year, my siblings and I would chase her around, trying to get her to sit down. Mom, sit down and enjoy the food instead of taking care of others the whole time. This year for Thanksgiving, we planned to visit friends and family out of state after spending time at mom's place. When Thursday rolled around, the Thursday before Thanksgiving, and I had not yet received those biopsy results back from the hospital, I knew that I would have to face that social dynamic without knowing for sure what was really wrong with me. Driving towards our holiday destination, I schemed as as to how to answer those questions that people might ask me. With so many questions myself, it was hard to know what to say. After some contemplation, I settled on the idea that I was hoping for the best and I had a great support network if I did, in fact, have cancer. Despite my conundrum, though, the Thanksgiving holiday and the subsequent weekend were rather enjoyable. Even though I was in complete limbo, I tried my best to stay in the moment and to cherish the time with friends and family. I enjoyed drinking wine and eating great food, and I even took some nice long walks around the neighborhood listening to music. Those long walks have always helped to clear my mind, allowing me to work through any complicated emotions or problems plaguing me. As I I took these walks this holiday weekend, there was one conclusion I kept coming back to. No matter what the diagnosis was, I was going to work hard to beat my disease. And I was incredibly lucky to have a great medical team caring for me. In addition to that, I was glad that I had switched out from the community hospital network. When you have a great medical team behind you, it really gives you a lot of confidence. I also told myself that I was going to fight cancer on two fronts, using both Western and Eastern medicine. That is, if I had cancer. Luckily for me, I had access to some of the best medical-grade cannabis anywhere, and I already knew firsthand about the amazing healing power of CBD and THC medicines. Most recently, I'd used them to help recover from that major knee surgery. Over the holiday break, everyone was incredibly supportive of me. They offered me encouragement and reminded me that they were pulling for me. But perhaps most importantly, they treated me like a normal person. That simple, kind gesture allowed me to settle in and enjoy myself. A welcome respite from my burgeoning health crisis. I also had, I had so much fun, in fact, that I even forgot about my medical problems for a little while. And I was able to appreciate the time with my father and aunt, who I really don't get to see that often. Once the holiday festivities were over, it was time for me to head home and to face my enemy. Next chapter. Okay, let's hear the news. We're going to get that diagnosis next chapter. This is my battles with cancer. This is the free version. I'm reading the entire book. I want the entire book to be available. I'm sharing my story. I was a cancer patient and a caregiver. My my mother also was diagnosed with cancer. Um, 
I really want to get this book out there. I think it can help a lot of people. Um, I spent a lot of 2023 editing the book and and re republishing the book um, from the initial publication in 2020. And I spent a lot of time working on the audio book, which is now available on Audible. Um, you can see my other work as well, Trading Wisdom, available on Amazon. It's done really well, and I want to say thank you to that for to you folks for that. Uh, Trading Quotes is also available. Great book. I'm super proud of that. I'm, of course, Big Cheds on Twitter, and you know I'm uh, Cheds Trading on YouTube. That's where you're watching this video right now. Um, so, folks, thank you so much. I'm going to be back with another chapter soon. I hope you're doing well, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.